know that you can. You can.
Uh, Lee McKnight, can you hear us? Welcome. It's Marilyn Glenn. Mr. McKnight, can you please speak?
Mr. McKnight, we can see you on the video. Can you please say something so we can be sure that we have your audio? Okay, can you hear me okay now? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, can you make it a bit more clearer? There's an... Uh, is, this, is this better? No, it's really faint. Just try to uh, increase the level of your microphone. Is this better now? Can you hear me now? Okay, that's much better now. That's not much better now. Thank you. Can you somehow lower the background noise? Uh, can you somehow lower the background noise? Yes, I'm going to hang up on the phone and just do it with the computer, right? Or should I use the phone? Can you hear me best? Can you hear me best? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't, uh, I don't receive you clearly. My name is Marilyn Cade, and apparently the most fun that a business representative ever has in their life is to inherit the opportunity to uh, open the meeting with pounding on a board. Um, that was a little joke. Um, thanks so much for coming to this session. And I'm going to just give a quick, um, so the session is entitled, Two Networks Will Shape Your Digital Future. And I'm just going to say a, um, a very brief um, historical um, comment about this workshop because it almost didn't happen. 
And that is because in the community within the Internet Governance Forum and in many other communities that talk about Internet policy, there is yet to be a appropriate recognition that if you um, do not have power of some kind, it is impossible to be consistently and reliably connected to the... I was getting there. <laughs> I got that, I got that. <laughs> um, if you do not have power that generates electricity, <laughs> thanks, Ben. Um, so we went through this experience that where Garland McCoy submitted an excellent workshop and several of the multi-stakeholder advisory committee members rejected it and rated it very low, which was a quite quite a big shock to me, uh, and so I went to the MAG representatives from Ghana, Fiji, Senegal, et cetera, and they made a very determined pitch to educate their other MAG members and not only are we doing the workshop, but it is no longer 60 minutes, it's 90 minutes. So I think we owe Garland a big vote of appreciation. And we also, and we also owe one of our speakers who will be arriving from Ghana, Wisdom Donker, um, a voice of a vote of appreciation because he is the MAG member who led the, um, I might say, revolt um, um, within the MAG to make sure that people understood the importance of power. We've spent quite a long time within the IGF understanding the importance of connecting the next billions. In fact, we have had intersessional work connecting the next billions one, two, and three series. And I will just want to mention that um, the work that the IGF USA that I am affiliated with uh, we first began, uh, we provided comments on the uh, first round of intercessional uh, comments to the IGF MAG, and my co-chair was Manu Badwaj from the State Department, and Manu will talk further in his comments about what inspired him to go on and become so directly engaged in these issues. So we already have begun to understand within the IGF that mere access is not enough, that you have to have capacity building, affordable devices, affordable access. But as we were saying earlier, there has been a lack of recognition of the extreme concern and problems that exist in the, uh, in the electrical energy area. Um, I also want to mention and uh, note that the work that IEEE is doing in picking up the follow-up to Global Connect in the area of advancing solutions, and I hope that they will talk a little bit more about that as well. So if we are committed to the promise of a more connected and a turned-on world where everyone has access, it's affordable, and they're able to use that access to improve their lives, to find healthcare information, to run their businesses, or just maintain communication with their neighbors, families, far flung as they are around the world. We have to step up to understanding, and I don't mean the people in this room, I know you're concerned and interested, but we have to step up to helping to build the understanding about the importance and the interdependency of the internet and electricity. The, techno the technological breakthroughs that are happening now, and we're gonna hear about some of them, are going to help us make that access much more affordable. But I, I, I look at this as probably the first of what I hope will be many discussions about the two networks. I am now going to introduce the lightning speakers, and they will speak very, very, they have about a five minute slot each. They will speak in order, and after they speak, I have asked Vince Cerf, the chief evangelist of Google, to take 10 minutes providing responses to what he heard, his thoughts, and also add his own perspectives on these issues. And then we will open this up to questions. We have a remote hub located at Syracuse University. We want to welcome them and suggest that we will try to hear them in their questions, but we will also, also ask them to type their questions and send them to Garland.
uh, so that we can read them out even if we don't uh, actually hear the speakers. Let me now turn to our first speaker. Manu will speak in two segments and he will kick off our uh, first segment by talking to us about why he became so interested and involved in the concerns about connecting the next billions. Thanks, Marilyn. It's really a pleasure to be with you and other global leaders uh, in the internet development space. Um, I think for me, um, when I look at um, the realities on the ground, um, the, the reality of, the la of four billion people without access to the internet, potentially the reality of 1.2 billion people or more without access to electricity, uh, the reality of 2.5 billion people or more uh, who are not banked, meaning they have no bank accounts, they don't have access to finance. I have an observation to maybe start the discussion. They have one thing in common. Uh, they're probably either in Africa or in Asia uh, in terms of where they reside. Um, there's a couple of other just a factual um, kind of <coughs> things that I want to lay on the ground, which is that in certain areas, for example, in rural India and Africa and Asia, uh, a lot of their reality is spending 30 cents a day or 6% of their entire household spending, and they're not spending it on energy uh, access, but on kerosene lighting. Uh, so really kind of thinking about their limited access to just basic technology, and kerosene uh, expenses are rising, actually, and so it's actually becoming even harder for them to uh, portion uh, their budget for this type of expense. And, and then also, you know, people talk about mobile penetration, and it's wonderful how much it's growing, but there's a linkage also for us to think about in just the how much they're spending on charging their phones um, and, and just the access uh, that is required in terms of their household um, incomes. You know, there is a worldwide, um, there's great worldwide focus on these issues and I think it's just worth mentioning it at the outset. One is that the World Bank, companies like MasterCard, which I'm a part of, um, have uh, committed to trying to achieve universal financial access by 2020. Uh, that's really that's really great. That's a multi-stakeholder effort um, to really bring more attention to how you can help people access a, an account, elect, electronic instrument to store money, and it's all done in recognition of the value of digital technology and actually bringing financial uh, transactions and making that a reality to people. Uh, the other, uh, I think, worldwide effort to talk about is a sustainable development agenda and how we won't be able to achieve any of it without energy, without internet, without electricity, without access to finance. Uh, another kind of, I think, global effort that Marilyn wanted me to focus on is uh, the Global Connect effort, uh, which you know is a, was a U.S. government effort launched three years ago, uh, which counted over 40 countries and. Uh, as partners and sought to bring 1.5 billion people online by 2020. And now I think the, the vision of the Global Connect effort has really been carried very uh, mightily by IEEE, by World Economic Forum, by the IGF, by a lot of multi-stakeholder organizations, uh, which I think is fantastic. Um, but there are a few observations that I would just like to make uh, on that effort, and maybe there are certain lessons that we can take away as we try to promote these development projects. One is it was so valuable to make internet access a foreign policy priority of the United States. To have senior leaders like Secretary Kerry, the head of state of the United States, President Obama, actually say the internet is fundamental to all aspects of our life and we would actually like to see the World Bank double their spending to developing countries, right, in development projects. There was actually a really important role for the U.S. or any country to play, uh, whether the U.S. or not, in trying to promote global internet access. The other thing was the really interesting linkage with the finance world and internet access. That was the first time that um, we invited finance ministers to talk about internet connectivity and a lot of them were surprised. They were like, I think you invited the wrong minister. I think you mean the communications minister who's my friend. And we're like, actually that's kind of the point is that the internet is such a valuable uh, piece of technology that it impacts, of course, the finance world, the fintech world, but you also as finance minister are a very senior person in the cabinet uh, in terms of the deployment of universal service funds, in terms of a lot of the decision making that is made, and you need to understand and we want you to be playing a leadership role in all of this. Um, so I think the importance of engaging the finance community, the World Banks, the MDBs, and, and really not having a siloed approach but a, a more comprehensive approach. The final two things I would like to mention in terms of lessons learned for us as we think about these development 
issues is one, it was really valuable, I think, for um, with the Global Connect effort to just give more prominence to work that's being done at the head of state level. So let, there's so many fantastic organizations like Network Startup Resource Center, Internet Society, other organizations uh, that are country level uh, from Japan, other governments, but they're all kind of doing that without uh, recognition of the broader community of all the impact that they're having, and they all benefit with greater political attention, greater support, uh, greater kind of um, attention and resources, right? Because that's what will happen when you get this attention uh, to the work that they're doing. And so we had actually done almost a summary of all the global actions that are being done, and it ended up being valued at over $10 billion. Um, the final thing is just empowering the technical community to help uh, produce solutions um, and, and really uh, helping emerging countries and making sure that they have access. Because I think in many conversations that we have at the IGF, or elsewhere, you know, I myself am a lawyer by training. I'm not a, uh, a technical person who knows how to actually um, bring connectivity to a refugee camp in Africa. Uh, but actually having those people as part of the discussion that we're having today about internet access, internet connectivity, and having them even lead uh, kind of some of these panel discussions is important, but oftentimes we don't find them in the room. Uh, and I think with uh, efforts like Global Connect, whether we're thinking about energy solutions or connectivity solutions, the engineering uh, core is absolutely critical for us to actually make tangible progress. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Manu. And we will come back to you at the end before we go to Vince. So I want to go to um, Chris Haig, and I will introduce Craig. He will introduce himself, but I will introduce him first by telling you this is his first IGF, and probably when he heard about it, he wondered why he was coming. So we'll hear who he is and, um, and your comments on behalf of Afghan Wireless, and then any other thoughts you want to sh share with us, Chris. Great. Good afternoon. Thank you, Marilyn, and the IGF for the opportunity to participate in today's important session. Uh, again, I'm Christopher Haig, Managing Director of EMI Advisors, a technology and innovation advisory services firm focused on assisting uh, commercial and government clients with energy, telecom, and financial infrastructure investments. Um, I'm a former Pentagon, senior Pentagon official and telecommunications executive, and I'm guessing I may be the only engineer on the panel, so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not. Okay, no, no, sorry, I forgot about the ITRO with this. So it's good to have another engineer on the panel. So, so. Uh, so the, the lack of electricity in developing countries is a major barrier to overcoming uh, illiteracy, generating economic opportunity, improving social well-being, and attracting foreign direct investment in these economies. Despite investment in the billions of dollars over the last, uh, billion dollars reigned over the last decade, rural electrification uh, remains unchanged. The majority of attempts to close the rural electrification gap have really focused on two areas, expanding uh, centrally planned uh, power grids and deploying small-scale standalone power generation solutions which basically resulted in island grids. Neither of these uh, approaches had made significant progress in closing that gap due to the remote nature of these communi communities and small population densities. In contrast to the electrification gap, there has been massive growth in the deployment of telecommunication services throughout uh, the world with significant strides made in rural and uh, poor communities. Growth in telecommunications networks have added over 4 billion uh, uh, mobile phone connections in the last 15 years. This growth can be directly attributed to the distributed nature of mobile phone networks over centrally planned line telephone networks. Um, this exponential uptake of mobile phone penetration is not limited just to the development, uh, developed world, as much of this growth has occurred in developing uh, rural and per poor communities. The main issues that are limiting the ability of these island grids to scale into distributed interconnected electricity networks that provide reliable low cost po power can be boiled down really into two areas. First is the, the lack of adequate revenue assurance models, and the second is the lack of microgrid standards that are enabling interconnectivity. Um, the lack of revenue assurance models uh, has been addressed over the past decade with mobile network service providers via prepaid uh, uh, phone cards. This technology exists today to do the same thing with rural microgrids, where you're applying smart card technology or mobile banking solutions to make sure people are paying for cards, uh, paying for electricity before it's used. This is something that's somewhat missed. Uh, the rubber insurance model is actually missed a lot when you're looking at donor-funded projects because the revenue assurance concept is sometimes an afterthought, um, and it's thought that 
people will just pay for the electricity because they want it, but once they have the grid there, and it's very hard for the local officials who are administering the grid to go and turn off a grid connection. So if you have a solution that actually turns it off automatically and they have to go find the individual to pay them, that revenue assurance model works and ensures that money is still going back into the grid and these become economically sustainable business models. So the second is with the application uh, of grid standards. Um, I spent a significant amount of time in Afghanistan looking at all of the different microgrids that were funded by various different donor entities. And what I found is you look at one after the other that are, uh, uh, one specific example is in the Panjshir Valley. Uh, I think we uh, looked at 40 microgrids that have been deployed by um, many different donor agencies. And what was interesting there is that none of them were built on the same standards and they had no ability to buy and sell power from each other. So because they didn't have the ability to buy and sell power from each other, they were never able to really achieve the benefits, the, the benefits of the economies of scales through interconnected distributed power solutions that would allow them to really get the electricity prices and the reliability down to where they needed this to, to happen. So, both Bell and Edison designed the, uh, both the telecommunications um, and the electricity grids well over 100 years ago. Um, in the past 30 years, we've seen a massive transformation in the telecommunications grid. We're just beginning to see that transformation now in the, uh, in, in the electricity grid. So, um, so the, uh, it, it, is the, it is this transformation of the electricity grid and the convergence of electricity networks, data networks, and financial networks coming together that will improve access to the poor to low-cost electricity, reliable internet, and uh, banking and financial services, all of which are needed for this population to compete in the global economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will, um, it's Marilyn Kate speaking. I was very um, fortunate to be in Afghanistan in March and um, even within uh, Kabul, there are major, major challenges in terms of access to uh, reliable electricity and we will be hearing from Omar more about that later. Um, and I'd like to turn now to Nelmany Rubin. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, thank you for having me. This is my third IGF, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm also, I work for a company called Tetra Tech. We're an engineering consulting company with um, 20,000 people in 130 countries, and we do energy work, um, telecom work, roads, water, infrastructure, kind of the range of, of engineering services around the world. Um, I previously worked for the U.S. Congress for the House of Representatives, the Senate, and then also in the White House and Treasury Department. This is my first proper job in the private sector. Um, so thank you for, for having me. And energy is a, a big part of what I'm passionate about, what Tetra Tech's passionate about. Um, when I worked for Congress, I wrote the Power Africa bill uh, for Chairman Royce, which laid the foundation for the Electrify Africa Act that laid the foundation for the Power Africa Initiative that um, where you have USAID funding massive power efforts in Africa, they're not just projects themselves, but transactions, putting transactions and advisors on the ground to get deals done um, and working on policy reform um, in the marketplace to, to, so it's not just for those specific transactions, but that those are leading so that future transactions can follow well. Um, we see energy as inextricably linked to the internet. Um, without, without energy, the internet just doesn't work. And as we are moving forward, we see that roughly 10% of the world's electricity consumption is already used for ICT. When you break it down from devices with internet of things, from the data centers, from the different pieces of, of networks off that are moving things around, um, the hardware manufacturing, it's already 10% and it's only gonna increase. You know, right now only half the world's population is even online. So as the other half gets online, it'll naturally increase energy demand, but also our use is increasing. So we get to driverless cars or other uses of, 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 the, of technology, we're gonna have more data to be stored and kept um, safe, which will require even more, ener more energy or electricity. So we need to really think carefully about 
for Electricity Solutions is money reference kind of where there's a lack of energy already and well over a billion people don't have electricity right now. It's, it's the same, often the same areas where they don't have internet access. So we really need to think carefully about doing it at the same time to save money and save the environment. And it's the, the build once approach. Um, I, I also um, wrote a bill for Chairman Rice called the Digital Gap Act, which um, makes it U.S. policy to, to adopt the Build Once approach. It's passed the House of Representatives twice and awaits passage now by the Senate. And it would make it would require our, our funding through the Millennium Challenge Corporation or the USAID, or, or um, we would push the World Bank and, and the IMF and the other donors that we use on a multilateral basis. To, um, to adopt a build once approach. So if you're building a road, you work with the other, with internet companies to see if there's um, an opportunity to do it all at the same time, because 90% of putting wire under a road is, is building the road and digging it back up again. So there's that. Um, but there's also more than roads, right? So it's, it's an open-ended idea. The other thing, so that's one type of integration we really need to think of with, with internet, but the other is, is gender. We've worked out a lot of principles on gender and energy um, and how to make sure that women are included in the process because they suffer more with lack of energy. Um, it, it's we're the ones who are going off and getting um, the, the energy sources to, to fire um, stoves and homes. Um, and a lot of that can be applied to the internet. What, what I find um, is something we need to push back on is this, we, we're in silos right now, where we have the energy folks talking to other energy folks and internet folks talking to other internet folks. And, and really, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's the same things holding women back and energy are the same things holding women back in the internet. And we can, we can do a lot of that um, at the same time. And um, that integration is really what's heartwarming about this first event at IGF on internet and energy. Um, the IEEE started this discussion last year in April. We had a panel um, with um, people from Microsoft, the World Bank, some other companies that I moderated in Washington, D.C. Um, and that got a lot of really positive feedback. Um, and it led to the creation of an IEEE working group on, on energy and internet that we um, have had our first meeting in October and are continuing to work through. Um, so we certainly uh, welcome people who are interested in, in reaching out to, to me as well, but we're very excited about the potential to synchronize the issues on, um, on that. One thing I wanted to, to kind of push back a little bit on donor funding is that we actually do spend a lot of time thinking about um, who's going to pay? Um, USAID. Um, a lot of their their projects really do look at at the the source, the, the financial system sustainability of the project, and, and the, we actually have a team right now um, that Tetra Tech employs in Nigeria doing really dangerous work. We're, we're, we're working for the distribution company, and we're actually going out and disconnecting payers who are not paying. Um, and it's, it's really, it's, it's very challenging um, and important work because it clearly creates an incentive for payment, and that, that is funded by USAID. So I will leave that there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, uh, I really want to just applaud to go back to a comment that you made, Marilyn Cade speaking, um, uh, pointing out the uh, really significant impact on women when there is no energy source. Um, women and girls who are walking into the forest to find uh, wood to be able to heat their homes or who are uh, forced to walk great distances in India and other countries to find um, uh, drinkable water. And that has such a, um, the, the implications where children actually cannot study they may be able to go to school, but there is no um, electricity, there's no p power source, so they're unable to study late into the evening, or they're studying uh, with a uh, uh, kerosene lamp, et cetera. I know I did that, but I was hoping that 70 years later, others wouldn't be doing it as well, but I really appreciate your pointing that out. And I want to go next, Bill, if I may. 
Thank you, Marilyn. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And this too is my first IGF, although IEEE has participated in this for a number of years. Um, uh, my name is Bill Ash. I'm the Strategic Director, Technology Director of the IEEE Standards Association, the arm in IEEE that deals with standards and, and technology. Um, and you know, to go to uh, what Marilyn was saying and Chris and, and such, I'm going to highlight a few points. And coming from an a organization that has multiple societies that will argue over which, which network is more important, the data side. Uh, you know, the economy that goes along with sharing data and the businesses and such, or the power and energy society that says, well, you can't share that data if you don't have power, so good luck. Um, so from that perspective, you know, I, they're both important. Uh, they equally provide services in a manner that allows for economies to grow for businesses and also providing natural services uh, for those that need to have electricity and other things that the electricity actually provides for them for the quality of living and, and such. And, and with that, I'm going to highlight Two, two projects that we're working on, and one of them will address Chris's question, hopefully. Uh, the other is uh, addressing some of the other issues and challenges of bringing electricity uh, that allows this connectivity to reduce the, the digital, digital divide between our economies. And so our Smart Village projects, projects and initiative provides power, education, and training, as well as employment to those that are locally there uh, to make the unconnected connected and helping to reduce the di digital divide and allowing the ability to provide uh, digital connectivity through power, power services and microgrid deployments. Um, I'll give an example in uh, Lang Langshed uh, Monastery in India. Um, we've partnered with the Global uh, Himalaya Expedition and helped to set up DC microgrids that actually provides uh, 100 watts to 300 watts of power um, while providing uh, low power computers and LED uh, displays as well as LED lighting and systems that will allow operations for 10 hours for about 150 watts, uh, giving the local community and their students the ability to have internet connection as well as power and energy uh, to provide other services for a quality of living. Um, so providing these type of equipment and service to them, not only do we have a business model to sustain payment uh, with some also some funding, fundraising to help subsidize some of the cost, uh, we've looked at both of those models to make sure they're sustainable and as well as providing services and, 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 and economies to those environments. And not only providing equipment, we also train the locals on how to maintain the equipment, how to run the equipment, uh, and troubleshoot so that they actually learn new skills to provide themselves a better quality of living as well as income, uh, but also learn to help produce for the community that the equipment's serving. Um, <clears throat> and so from there, you know, we're looking at how to provide these DC microgrids to these villages that never had power, and then that gives them the ability to provide a di digital infrastructure uh, to give education to their kids, to their next generation of leaders that are going to help drive that country and those local regions as well. Um, the second part of it I'm going to highlight is our DC microgrid standard. Uh, it's actually P2030.10. It's for rural and unconnected uh, grid support uh, for those that don't have electricity or infrastructure. Uh, for the needs of actually supplying power. And it's exactly to address Chris's concern on, instead of having all these uh, different styles of microgrids, having standardized requirements of what they're, how they're connected, how they're deployed to allow these interoperability and technologies to be connected to provide these energy to these folks in a standardized mechanism. So it not only reduces the cost to the manufacturer, they then can reduce the cost to the deployment of it uh, based on standard economy of scale based on standards. And so with that, um, I'm just going to close it there and, and say, you know, this, the work that everybody's doing here, it's all important to make it happen. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. I have a couple of questions for you, but I'll reserve them uh, until a little bit later. Um, and um, I'm going to uh, turn to uh, Omar, and he will introduce himself. Thank you so much, Marilyn and Garland, for the opportunity. My name is Omar Mansour Ansari. I'm running a business based in Kabul, Afghanistan. It's called Tech Nation, and we do uh, technology uh, software development uh, and a lot of work uh, with a community that includes uh, um, uh, capacity building trainings and skill building, doing hackathons and other. Um, uh, 
you might be aware Afghanistan is in the middle of uh, Central Asia and South Asia, and it connects and interconnects the, uh, the regions. Uh, not only Central Asia and South Asia, but also uh, the Middle East and uh, China. And also it's a gateway uh, to Europe as well. Uh, Afghanistan, uh, when the rest of the world in the past 30 years uh, to 40 years were making development, we were fighting the Soviets. Uh, so that's why uh, we are a little behind from our neighbors. Uh, they have a better infrastructure, but the infrastructure we had was destroyed first in the war against the Soviets, and then we started fighting against each other, uh, and that uh, destroyed uh, the rest of the infrastructure. But in the past thir thir uh, 13, 15 years, uh, when the um, uh, international peace keeping forces came to Afghanistan. They have contributed to uh, infrastructure development as well as uh, capacity development and working a lot on the policy um, um, issues as well. So Afghanistan um, uh, initially being a, a kind of very, um, you know, reserved in uh, letting the private sector do um, uh, some of the work, you know, related to the infrastructure. Uh, it has privatized uh, uh, s uh, several sectors, and that includes um, ICT, power, uh, and a few other, and education. But initially, it was the government who would take uh, care of the um, the, the electricity uh, in the um, uh, telecom and others. Uh, we still have quite a number of challenges that includes uh, connectivity, and that's mainly uh, due to the cost of internet. It's $150 uh, per Mbps of a speed. Uh, if you have a 100 Mbps uh, internet, that will cost you uh, 1500 to uh, 15000 to 16000 euros dollars a month and that's extremely expensive uh, although we have the benefit of being the only country that provides an optical fiber ring throughout the country which connects uh, Central Asia Tajikistan Uzbekistan Kazakhstan um, uh, Turkmenistan and then Iran uh, as well as Pakistan we don't have a, a connection with China now but they're working uh, on this digital literacy has been an issue local content and technology Technology. That's uh, uh, technologies. That's one of the issues because people do not see the benefits of uh, a common Afghan. I'm uh, talking about the end users. They don't see the benefit of investing on a, a bandwidth that's expensive. If we can provide them with the local content so they can see uh, the benefits, like uh, uh, their children could uh, learn some, uh, have access to some educational material online in their own language and other benefits that it provides, uh, I'm sure they're going to uh, start, uh, you know, um, uh, investing on that. Taxation has been an issue. Government officials, their interest uh, in uh, partnering with the businesses. If you, there are certain government officials who also have companies registered under their names, or they are partnering with uh, some of the, you know, existing businesses, and that creates an issue for the startups uh, to grow, you know. Um, Financing has been an issue for the startups, but uh, still uh, there are a number of incubators that are formed uh, and they're contributing to, uh, you know, the uh, development of the uh, new startups. Uh, there are a couple of really big programs um, that you might have heard about uh, that uh, would really contribute to the power um, access and as well as the uh, internet access. One of them is called the CASA 1000, which is a uh, Central Asia, South Asia, uh, when we say CASA, it's Central Asia, South Asia. Uh, it's a power project uh, um, uh, of about uh, 1.16 uh, billion uh, dollars, and the purpose is to um, uh, to tr uh, trans uh, transfer the uh, hydroelectricity from Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan to Pakistan and Afghanistan. So Afghanistan will be providing a transit route to, uh, route to Pakistan as well, and. Uh, mm, 
it's planned to be uh, to complete by end of uh, 2018. But still, security has been an issue. Um, the areas it's passing through uh, is. Um, uh, they're remote areas and mostly controlled by Taliban. Uh, the other uh, project, which is um, very, uh, um, uh, which will um, uh, really support the uh, Afghan infrastructure in access to uh, technologies, called the Digital Casa. It's 75 uh, million dollars of a project uh, that uh, is supported by the World Bank. Uh, and it's going to be uh, having uh, certain components which includes uh, private sector development, public sector management in human uh, development and gender. Uh, so we are really looking forward to this project, not only this one, but we also look forward to the contribution from other international uh, organizations, uh, uh, corporates uh, who uh, can really help with the, uh, you know, skill building initiatives, local technologies, as well as uh, uh, local content in Afghanistan, so it can really serve the purpose uh, in, in achieve our goal of becoming the future uh, hub for the ICTs in the uh, CASA region. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I have a number of questions for you that I want to follow up on. Uh, but before we do that, I want to introduce wisdom. When I opened this workshop, I mentioned that this workshop proposal, although it was really excellent in my view, um, it, it was there's a threshold that workshops have to reach in a rating by the, uh, an anonymous rating by the MAG members. And this one fell short by probably uh, less than 0.02%, but there was a magic cutoff of only 75. Um, and my colleague from Ghana, who is dear friends with a name that I think Vint will recognize, Dr. Nee Quainar, who is known for bringing the internet to Africa. Um, Wisdom pointed out to me that it was extremely disappointing that other MAG members didn't understand the situation in Africa. And he happened to be sitting in front of a colleague from Fiji who overheard the conversation. And the WISIS forum was going on at that time. And there was an IEEE brochure about smart uh, villages and the importance of power. And Wisdom and Sala went to their booth and brought back these brochures, which were evidence of the challenges that existed worldwide in access to power, gave them to the other MAG members, and then did a sort of a little four minute explanation going. Um, developing country MAG member by developing country MAG member explaining the problem. And somehow, gee, magically, uh, the facts mattered and our colleagues in the MAG became supportive of this workshop. So I want to give him complete credit for having, to ma having made this happen. So we'd like to hear from you uh, about your thoughts about the inner, inner relationship and your views about where things are in Africa and how you, how you kind of see the importance of how we move forward on this. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you, Marilyn. And uh, thank you, Galant, for bringing this uh, interesting uh, topic uh, for discussion. Uh, indeed, when it comes to electricity in, in Africa, it's a different situation altogether. And I believe uh, some of you might have traveled to Africa, especially in Nigeria, Ghana, and in other parts of Africa. They know how the situation is. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk uh, in my individual capacity, and then I'll use Ghana uh, as an example. And if possible, maybe there's one other Nigerian guy there, and uh, he might add from maybe the perspective of what Nigeria. Uh, with the situation of Ghana, we have a program uh, going on. Uh, I think it started somewhere um, in 1992, uh, of what extending the power grid to almost every part of uh, Ghana. Um, we've had different governments uh, coming into power, and uh, 
each of these government accounts uh, are committed to actually working to extend this power to the rural community. So as I'm speaking now, uh, we have a coverage uh, of about 80 percent, 80 and a little over percent uh, of coverage, but then there's, we still have more to do. Um, in terms of uh, connecting everyone and extending internet to almost every home that we talk about. I remember uh, in one instance, uh, in one of the remote area, there was this young guy who is doing this uh, uh, mobile uh, internet business, uh, telephone business. Uh, that is, uh, that was a time that we we're having this. Uh, calls, telephone calls coming in. So they were doing this mobile business. So what this guy does is what uh, he, he normally uses this car battery. I don't know how he did it uh, to be charging his phone. So it got to a time uh, it wasn't sustainable. So he has to be traveling to another village where there is electricity to charge all the mobile phones and then come back and then come and do business. So these are some of the things that is going on. And even with the sector that I work in, uh, we try to extend uh, fiber optic throughout the whole country of Ghana. So we've connected the whole country. So the issue that we're facing now is power, to, uh, to power all these base stations and all that, to give internet to this rural community. So we end up buying generators and all that, and <coughs> also sustaining this generator with uh, fuel and all that is also another issue. So the Energy Commission of Ghana, uh, uh, with its stakeholders, uh, thought it wise that they have to embark on uh, a re renewable energy uh, program. So what they are doing now is trying to extend communities where uh, have a low population and all that they try to extend this uh, solar energy system to these community areas but then there is still uh, a lot to be done in this uh, regard because we we lack that uh, transfer of what uh, the transfer of knowledge in regard to this uh, sector so uh, it's also another issue that we have to look at and then try and, and then address um, Apart from that, uh, we also need to encourage the African governments. Uh, it looks like we have good policies uh, in relation to, in regards to uh, energy, but implementation is another issue. So if we can maybe channel a little of our energy into solving the issues of uh, energy within Africa, uh, that will go, go a long way to help and uh, to help with it, uh, to help with connecting everyone, uh, for us to comfort comfortably talk about accessibility of internet, extending the internet to every home. Um, uh, yeah, so I think this is what uh, we need to also do and. Uh, Access and then the access and use of relevant renewable energy technologies is also another thing that we need to look at. Uh, we we need a lot of expertise in this uh, area uh, in Africa. So uh, I think this is. Thank you. Did, did you want to ask? Anything? Yes, um, Tommy, if you can uh, also add in regards to Nigeria. And be sure to state your name. Okay. Um, my name is Tommy, Tommy Ayorinde. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Mobile Forms. We're helping businesses, local and international, crowdsource reliable data across Africa. Um, we experience these problems too, which is the reason why um, we use mobile devices to crowdsource data in very remote areas. So what we've the reason why we built our platform to be offline first, so that people can capture their data offline and then it can synchronize online when they find internet connection. A problem is they have to go with extra batteries. Um, in some cases, we're trying to look for some ways to get them devices that can solar charge. But it's kind of the things that we're facing. Um, 
they have to go with extra devices and in some cases so i had a situation where um i had an agent who decided to go he was offline for about three days total three days track capturing data all through and we couldn't contact him and the reason why he did that was he was trying to save his power battery his phone battery so he refused to contact any phone calls switch it all off and then captured all the data he was mapping out health facilities i think he captured about um 70 health facilities i was super worried i was going to take a <laughs> I was going to get on the next flight and take a road trip and go and figure it out. But on the third day, he came up and then all his record got uploaded. So it's a major issue we have. And it's amazing that we have a whole lot of sun, if I will say it that way. Um, I am not an authority in this, but I think we need to figure out ways to use the resources we had to generate power. And I think the answer for us might be the sun. Um, more solar panels, more solar energy. I like to see more phones that are solar powered and that's sustainable. Um, I think they will go a long way in helping us um, achieve these goals. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn speaking. And I had the opportunity to learn more about what you're doing. I found it really fascinating and I uh, will urge others after the session is over to perhaps take the opportunity to learn more about the, um, the capturing of data and the purpose of that. I want to go back to Manu for two or three minutes and then we're going to go to um, Ben Serp, who I've asked to offer his thoughts and make some um, his own thoughts, but also make some responsive comments to what he's heard. So I'm going to turn to Manu for two or three minutes, and Bent is going to uh, come up and replace me here on the podium. And then after Bent speaks, then we will take questions from the audience, and we will start with the remote hub. So that's our plan for the rest of the time. Manu, the floor is yours. Thanks, Marilyn. And, uh, I think one of the genesis for this intervention was the observation that Marilyn made that, Manu, you may be the first uh, participant ever from a financial service company at the IGF. And it was an interesting observation. Of course, this is my seventh IGF. Marilyn and Vint have been probably to every IGF since it was founded, and so they would be in a position to know. Um, and it, it actually, there's a story to tell here because finance companies have had an integral role to play in, in, in development writ large. And the story is one of J.P. Morgan. Uh, J.P. Morgan, who many people uh, probably recognize the name and may feel, if you watch the History Channel, you may think that he's a robber baron or he was a capitalist, but he also had a very important relationship with Thomas Edison. And Thomas Edison, who was the inventor of the incandescent light bulb, uh, actually was turned down by many investors until J.P. Morgan uh, saw the potential of the technology, invested in it, uh, to the point where he lit his home up in New York uh, with, the, with the technology. Uh, and of course, New York, of course, became the first city uh, that benefited from Edison's uh, invention. Uh, but it, it, I think, uh, generally, it just shows you that um, there's the inventor and then there's the investors, and, and investors are part of the conversation and need to be part of the conversation. We heard that, actually, today from Omar and many others who talk about the need Need for financing for entrepreneurs. Uh, there's also just uh, us thinking creatively about how are we going to connect the last uh, couple, last billion, two billion, three billion, uh, and are there any new financing models that we can deploy in doing that? Um, and I just want to make, I, you know, I actually don't. I, I'm not sure about this number, I'll be more diplomatic, uh, but it is a number that is being used by the ITU. It was a number that uh, was said by Jim Kim, which is that to connect the next 1.5 billion people would require um, $450 billion, and I, I don't think that number is um, an accurate depiction of what technology can produce and how this evolves, but it, it just shows you that there is a significant amount of investment that has to come from private companies, from finance ministers, from the finance community, and it's incumbent upon us to perhaps more strategically engage one another. And now we're off to Vint. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's expensive. <laughs> we all set. Okay, well, first of all, thank you, Marilyn, for uh, allowing me to parachute in this way and uh, maybe try to uh, share a few thoughts. Um, 
I, the first thing I would observe is that instead of two networks, there's three, right? There's the electrical power grid, there's the internet, and there's the financial network. And so uh, we should change the two to a three uh, and be honest about the fact that we have to combine all three of those to produce the kind of benefit that I think we're all looking for. Um, the second thing I wanted to observe is a technical uh, point. The uh, traditional telecommunication networks, telephone networks in particular, were circuit switched. And they have a certain property that uh, for transport of data in a circuit switch network, the data rate at the input side has to be the same as the data rate at the output side because there's no storage in a circuit switch net. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, in the case of the internet, uh, we put storage in the system. The consequence of that is that you can push data in at one rate and take it out at a different one. Why is that relevant to the power grid? Well, if you start looking at renewable resources that are episodic, like the solar system doesn't work when the sun goes down, and the windmills don't work when the wind stops blowing, it's very important to be able to store power when you don't generate it and use that stored power until the generators come back. And so we have to use storage in both cases. And so the two have an interesting parallel. The biggest problem we have with episodic and renewable uh, energy resources is the cost uh, and longevity of storage of electricity. There are a variety of different ways of achieving that storage. In many of the hydroelectric systems, you literally pump water up the hill in order to uh, have it run down again when you need to generate more power. But not everyone has a power source that has water and hills. Uh, in order to generate power. So we look for other uh, possibilities as well. There's uh, the power that uh, you can you know, store away by spinning uh, wheels, for example, uh, and to when the, when the power generation stops, the wheel keeps spinning, and then you use it to generate power until you have a new source. So storage is going to be a big issue. I want to draw attention to a technical uh, type of uh, storage, it's called a redox flow battery. And those turn out to be resilient and scalable and recently affordable. Uh, in the past, they were expensive propositions. Uh, but uh, because I am convinced that the power systems that we will need uh, must work in an episodic environment, then better battery technology is also going to be needed in addition to various kinds of power generation. So that's something to, uh, to think about. Um, another thing which has occurred to me as I listen to uh, some of the narratives uh, is that most of the uh, discussion tends to be country by country. Uh, the you know, generation of a power grid, whether it's a distributed power grid or a central power grid with distribution, uh, tends to be uh, country by country. And so one of the questions I have for the people on the panel is whether in the African setting uh, there are cross-country power exchange arrangements. And I don't know if there are, but if there were not, uh, perhaps there should be. Uh, the internet doesn't work without internet exchange points linking the networks of the countries together. And uh, it's often the case that regional uh, internet exchanges are organized so that uh, we have a continuously connected network. Uh, there is, however, uh, a side effect of connecting power grids to each other. When failures happen, cascade failures occur, they propagate. And so one of the things that you are uh, persuaded to do is to build a power grid that has cutoffs and cutouts so that you can isolate yourself from what might be a failing uh, adjacent power grid. This is not too different than uh, in the internet where a failure requires the system to, be, to route around the failure if connectivity is still available. But I'd like to stop for a moment and, and ask, well, I don't know, Marilyn, how do you want to do this? I'm, I'm, I would like to see if there is an answer to this question of regional power 
uh, in the African scene. So if we could do that, and then I'll come back to some closing remarks, and then we'll have some more general Q&A, if that's okay. So you look like you're levitating out of your chair, so good. Uh, for the record, I'm a wisdom donker. Um, in the case of uh, Africa, uh, uh, for that matter, Ghana, um, we, uh, in the early days of independence, I think uh, Ghana had this uh, hydro uh, power uh, system. And then uh, over the years, uh, we've tried to extend power to uh, Burkina Faso, uh, I think Côte d'Ivoire, uh, Togo, and then I think part of uh, Benin. So in, in our case, from my part of the region, uh, there is uh, some sort of uh, regional power, uh, cross-country uh, power sharing. But then uh, it's, it's not enough. It's not enough. Uh, we still, it's not enough in, in terms of the hydro generation capacity doesn't allow to extend to, to expand to, yeah. So we need to look at other sources of energy to complement what we already have. So there's another, um tactic which has been used to build, uh, under, you know, underwrite the cost of and build telecommunication networks. In the case of internet, uh, I'll give you one example, uh, in um, both in Ghana uh, and uh, also in Uganda, uh, Google uh, has been building um, an optical fiber network, uh, which is made available uh, on wholesale, on a wholesale basis. So it's not a, it's not a giveaway, it's not free, but it's intended to offer a wholesale rate to allow um, a retail, uh, competitive retail internet services to be built up by uh, local uh, companies, local investors. Uh, so the question I have is whether there's a, any conceivable similar tactic that makes sense. Can there be wholesale electricity and retail electricity? Now, I'm asking this as an engineer who doesn't know anything about economics. Uh, does it make any sense? And Manu might even be able to say whether uh, he would consider investing in such a scheme. I would be hesitant to invest in anything called a scheme. <laughs> But I think- Well, I th thanks, Manu, that's a big help. <laughs> I really appreciate it. But I, I do think that there is a lot of, uh, look, there's a lot of uh, family-owned offices. There are a lot of, there's a lot of high-end capital out there that is absolutely excited about investing in these types of experiments uh, because they understand both the philanthropic nature of doing the test and the pilot and seeing what insights you can learn even from failure, but then also the, the profitability if it goes to scale. So the, the usually, Scale is attractive because costs are driven out. Costs per unit are driven out. And if you believe in uh, subsidies in order to encourage uh, investment, then you can see the possibilities of even a government investment, let alone a private sector investment, uh, in this wholesale uh, framework in order to provide, effectively provide uh, in the income to grow the rest of the infrastructure. And I have one, one uh, funny story to tell you uh, about my personal situation in the Washington DC area. I live in McLean, Virginia, and several years, where you would expect that electrical power would be reliable. There was one year where two weather-related events uh, lost power for five days each. Now, I have a wine cellar, which has about 2,000 bottles of wine in it. And after the first five-day outage, I started to get very nervous. After the second five-day outage in the same year, uh, I purchased a 50-kilowatt gas-driven generator and put it in the backyard after overcoming the complaints of the local homeowners association of this ugly thing. Uh, but I felt compelled to provide myself with backup power uh, because it wasn't reliable enough. 
yeah, you know, from you know, the, the power available from the uh, power companies. So I just hope that makes you feel a little bit better that uh, even well-developed uh, countries have problems with reliability. However, I, I don't necessarily recommend that uh, everybody go and put a 50 kilowatt generator in your backyard. I will point out, however, that microgrids are becoming a very um, attractive alternative to centralized power generation and distribution, partly uh, because the, the uh, equipment that's needed to do that, to build the microgrid, it can be standardized, whereas the very large-scale centralized power generation systems are often specific to the site where they are, are uh, designed and installed. And so once we get to standardization of generation and distribution, we can reduce the costs of some of those devices. So there is no reason why countries that are still trying to find a way to generate power need to follow the same path, historical path, that uh, other countries have if there are these alternatives available. So, Marilyn, I think I should stop there and, and see whether we have a discussion that, uh, that people would like to pursue. Thank you very much, Bent. And um, we are checking, Garland is checking with our uh, remote hub. They have posted a couple of comments privately. We're asking them if they want them read out. But we're going to start with uh, questions. And I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm going to start, and uh, Bill, I don't mean to put you on the spot, and uh, but I'm going to mention an activity of um, IEEE. Um, I realize I didn't give you a heads up on it, and it may not fall in your area of expertise, but um, I've been very privileged to learn a little bit about your Smart Villages activities. And I've been very excited about that because the countries that um, the initiative that Omar has launched with others called Tech Women Asia is um, actually has a lot of countries that have villages in need of uh, power. And in some cases, those countries have thousands of islands. Um, so uh, we, I, I recently became very familiar with one of the smart villages in Nigeria. Um, if you could speak a little bit about the, the concept, because that's a very modularized, standardized project. And while you're uh, addressing that, I want you to also explain how you're managing to do that at IEEE at such low cost. I know the answer, but I think it would be inspirational for people to hear. Uh, so, um, thanks, thanks, Marilyn. So, yeah, so I, I mentioned the India project, but that, that's also a pilot project that's been deployed uh, in many different countries and, and areas, as Marilyn mentioned, Nigeria being one. We've done Cameroon, uh, we're doing Hades, and a few other areas as well. And basically, it is a, a modular project where uh, it's a self-sustained microgrid where it has a solar uh, as a generation of the energy. It's got its own storage facility to, to keep for the intermittence of uh, the solar power and the ability to communicate back into a, a central environment through that distribution network. And so there, there's a couple of ways that, you know, I don't know if this is going to hit the answer that you were looking for, but we've done fundraising to, to seed the money, but we've also looked at uh, standardizing these deployments to reduce the cost and to make them reasonably accessible to the local environment uh, where we're talking like six dollars a month or two dollars a month for replacing kerosene uh, generation and actually providing an, an infrastructure where it doesn't exist and to go to Vince's question or answer uh, some of the concerns that Vince raised, um, you know, one of the, the criteria around these modular microgrids is that at some point in time when governments get around to funding infrastructure that can make these remote villages connected, uh, 2030.10 talks about how to standardize the deployment requirements, and then another IEEE standard, 1547, gives you the requirements to connect them to the grid. And so the standards are there in place, so when they're ready to make these modular connections happen and build out the economies so that we can build these villages that don't have an inter uh, a grid-connected environment, and eventually at some point in time when they will, uh, there, there is technology that's available and standards to help it make it happen. And so the answer so the question is, is we're trying to reduce the cost through standardization, we're trying to reduce the cost through modularization, and then make it uh, 
capacity building by training the local environment to also provide employment to help uh, do the maintenance and everything to reduce those costs as well. So there's one other interesting thing that's happening in the power generation world. Uh, we've been generating power one kind or another for over 100 years. Uh, there was a big battle in the early stages between Westinghouse and Edison about AC and DC. And I can remember uh, Edison uh, trying to show how dangerous AC was by uh, essentially demonstrating that, uh, that you, know, you could kill a hot dog with AC. Uh, and he, he was sort of the killer app, right? So um, that fight was lost by the DC people for a variety of different reasons. Well, the battle has resumed, and the, uh, a, a new interest, a renewed interest in uh, DC generation and distribution uh, is, uh, is coming forward, partly uh, for transport. So to give you an example, uh, in the Northeast in the United States, there is a plan to put in a large number of uh, windmills that are about 50 miles offshore, so they aren't visible uh, to spoil the view of people who have uh, you know, shorefront property. Uh, but in order to take the energy uh, back, a, uh, a significant uh, bus structure needs to be built to take the DC from the windmills. And the reason that it's better to take DC than AC is that combining the energy from the windmill is a lot easier if it's just direct current because we're just pushing electrons as opposed to worrying about phase and, uh, and all, you know, frequency and all the other things that AC demands of you. So that may, too, introduce a different set of economics and certainly a different technology. And when you look around uh, and see how many devices right now are stepping AC to DC in order to power them, we'd get rid of a lot of wasteful conversion if we could stick with DC and convert only to AC when that seems to make sense. Thanks, Ben. I'm, I'm going to ask a... Um question that I'm going to direct toward Omar and uh, Nomini and, um, if I can, Chris. Um, I uh, worked for a number of years in the uh, communications sector for a uh, very large communications company. And then I was married for a number of years, and so I knew all about the um, egos or the behaviors or the expectations of CEOs and companies in the communications sector. And then I was married for a number of years to the chairman of the FERC. And the energy CEOs and the challenges of dealing with introducing competition in the energy world were um, kind of uh, mind-boggling. So I'm looking at the importance of cross-communication, cross-ministry cooperation, um, openness to competition, moving from, in some cases, government-supported uh, or government-partly-owned uh, businesses that's been made reference to. And I'm asking the three of you, because you're all working in uh, countries where the ability to communicate with multiple ministries and to communicate openly, fairly, and transparently uh, is um, a real challenge. And I I wonder if you have thoughts for us about ideas for how to um, improve the, the access for the private sector to engagement and interaction with the relevant ministries. And I think I'm going to start with Omar. Thank you, Marilyn. That was a good question. Uh, there are uh, certain um, issues when it comes to, uh, especially in Afghanistan, uh, to collaboration. Uh, we have some policy regulatory challenges. For example, uh, for a public-private partnership, there is no clear uh, cashback system. The, the cashback system is very complicated in Afghanistan so far. And there was no uh, uh, policy on uh, public-private partnerships. By cashback system being complicated is that, for example, if you would like to partner with the AFGNEC, which is uh, managed by the uh, government into the Ministry of Communications, it's a department within the Ministry of Communications. By selling the .af domain name, it can have a lot of revenue 
it's uh, 30 million uh, of a population, and the DF is a very attractive uh, domain name. Uh, you can sell it outside Afghanistan as well. Uh, but uh, the government is not open to partnering with a private sector, uh, you know, a company. They cannot manage it. And the number of uh, users is very, do domain names they sell per year is very small. Uh, but it can become like a huge revenue source for the uh, government as well as uh, the entity that would partner with the government. But the problem is if uh, the entity has a profit sharing model with the DF, uh, then the money would go to the uh, central bank, uh, Minister of Finance's account, and it would not come back to the um, uh, to DF. It will go as uh, Ministry of Communications in IT's budget. So that makes it a little complicated when it comes to, you know, uh, partnering at that level. But broadly, a multi-stakeholder approach would be great. I'm glad uh, uh, to have Nilmini and uh, Chris here who have experience in Afghanistan. Tetra Tech has been working and contributing um, to the de uh, in the development projects, you know, um, working with USAID and others and Afghan Wireless uh, being the first, uh, you know, uh, telecom operator in Afghanistan, um, they have so much experience in the country, and uh, that experience could be shared with others, like smaller companies in the civil society organizations, uh, on how they have handled and addressed issues like this in the past. There are quite a few issues we are facing as business um, that is, uh, that's affecting uh, our growth and development. One of them is uh, the e-payment system. We do not have an e-payment system in Afghanistan, and that's making it, uh, making it really uh, hard for us to develop. So if MasterCard Foundation, Google, for example, and IEEE and others um, have solutions, you know, and we are not the only country who has the e-payment uh, problem with the e-payment. Uh, so if uh, we can share that sort of uh, experiences in this panel, uh, really provide you know, um, people with great experience and knowledge around these areas. So my question back would be uh, to all the panels, especially Google, IEEE, MasterCard Card Foundation, and then uh, my friends for, from Tetra Tech and AWCC on how we can collaborate to address these issues. So I'm gonna give, before I come to you, I'm gonna give an assignment to Garland and to Wisdom. So apparently the uh, workshop proposal for next year is of the three networks. <laughs> I'm going to come to you in a minute, Ben, but first of all, I want to hear from uh, Nomini and Chris, and then I'm going to come to you to make a response thing. Um, well, thanks for the, the question. How to improve private sector access is a challenge in developing countries. It's also a challenge in the United States. So um, it's, a, it's a great one. Um, I think to, to increase private sector access, it's, it takes leadership from the business community and leadership from the government community together and figuring out where where there are points of, of intersection or um, interest in collaboration. Um, part of that is coming together on issues with a question of how do, how do we solve this issue rather than let's talk about the issue, right? So how do you solve brings people to the table with, with potential solutions that they can bring. Um, if just discussing the challenge of, of internet access lets people sit in their positions and um, and then argue from where they are and it doesn't necessarily move the ball forward. I, I learned that working at the White House when we would bring agencies together. Um, it didn't work to just to have a topic as the top the, the thing to, to bring them together. Um, we, um, we just saw this week the, the Trump administration released its national security strategy and um, of interest to this group, one is that it included attaining universal energy access as one of, of the priority issues in underdevelopment. It talked about how um, the US will seek to ensure universal access to affordable, reliable energy, including highly efficient fossil fuels, nuclear, and renewables, help re reduce poverty, foster economic growth, and promote prosperity. It, um, 
you know, it's it's definitely that model of phrasing is ripe for including internet access potentially in the in a future national security strategy. But specifically to the the question, it did include language on um, development finance institution reform. Um, and the development finance institutions like the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, U.S. Trade and Development Agency, and so on are, are really ways that the U.S. government uses to crowd in the private sector. Um, and it's a tool that we use to encourage people to, to invest in developing countries. And the, the national security strategy talks about how the U.S. is going to modernize our, our, our development finance tools so U.S. companies have invested incentives to capitalize on opportunities in developing countries and with the and it really talks about why that's a benefit to the u.s and in addition to the developing countries and it says with these changes the u.s will not be left behind as other states use investment and project finance to extend their influence um, the u.s government must not be an obstacle to u.s companies that want to conduct business in the developing world thank you very much and i'm going to be a little more pointed in my question <laughs> So Chris, we were in a session yesterday where um, someone mentioned to the head of a regulatory authority that they had seen, they're from that country, that they had seen that uh, the head of the regulatory authority more often at the IGF than they had been able to get in to see them in their offices. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe I could just ask you to comment as a, a um, someone who works in uh, these countries about the access to the regulatory authorities and the access to the various ministries and how you see that emerging. So, you know, in regards to access to the regulatory authorities, it depends on which authority you're talking about. But what I've seen in this, uh, in specifically in a place like Afghanistan is we've, uh, the donor community has actually exported bureaucracies to these uh, countries and then there's frameworks that they're following. But what happens is, is you're, you have people focusing just inside those boxes. So we've, we've really taken th things that we've used in the U.S. or things that have worked in other countries and exported them there. But when you're looking at things that go across multiple regulatory bodies, it gets very, very complex. So um, I guess I'll take sort of two examples of one, how I've seen something, how something's worked, and then one, how we're going through some issues right now. So when Afghan wireless communications started in Afghanistan, there was no regulatory authority to actually do this. They were the first GSM operator, so they actually worked with the Ministry of Communications um, and the donor community to design the regulatory authority around that that then laid the foundation for the other GSM operators to come into the country. Um, the uh, uh, Biot Group, which is the parent of AWCC, is uh, also involved in uh, an IPP program right now. And the challenge on that front is you're dealing with a regulator um, in the Afghan government who regulates the sale of gas, you're dealing with a regulator who regulates the uh, procurement of electricity, you're dealing with folks in the Ministry of Finance, and when you bring all of these guys together, they're all stuck with the rules that they've been given by some other agency. So what really has to happen in that, uh, in that situation, um, and it's not, it's, it's very similar to, to when you're working in a big company. You have to take this out of each one of these organizations. You need to bring it up all the way to the top, and you have to find a champion that's going to sort of shake this up and say, all right, guys, let's think about this a little bit differently, because if we keep going about this, the only ones who are going to win here are the lawyers who are negotiating everything on both sides. <laughs> we, you know, so it, it really takes a change agent that's, you know, that has almost the president's ear or the president's champion's ear to make things happen. And then to use those transactions to make, to readjust the frameworks that uh, they currently have in the regulatory bodies. I'm going to give Vint uh, two minutes to respond, and then I'm going out to the audience. But I'm just going to mention that actually uh, Manu was an, with Global Connect was an excellent example of going all the way to the top. But let me turn to you, Vint, for two minutes, and then we will hear from others who have questions. So I'm going to uh, start out by uh, offering you a fantasy from an engineer looking <laughs> at the problems we've been talking about. So I'm going to ignore uh, the obvious political complexities of dealing with multiple ministries and multiple regulatory agencies. If I am a systems engineer and I'm trying to get something to happen, I would like to design it from the systems point of view. Well, what is it that I'm trying to accomplish? I certainly want to get power and communications uh, infrastructure built. Uh, how will we do that? Well, when you're 
building roads, you might consider putting in conduit so that you can pull fiber. When you're building a power generation and distribution system, you might consider designing it so that it can also carry communication signals, partly to control the grid and partly to offer communication services. But this requires cooperation and collaboration across the various ministries who may be managing the infrastructure projects. Uh, and so that's not so simple, but if, um, if in fact we want to make this process effective, we are going to have to try to persuade the multiple ministries with their multiple incentives and motivations to step back for a moment and ask, how can I make optimal use of my uh, development capacity in order to dig once, pull fiber, uh, and, uh, or pull conduit, and then pull fiber to make this a much more efficient uh, arrangement? Now, whether that's possible, I don't know. As I say, that's the engineer's fantasy, doing systems design to make things come out better. Thanks, Ben. Let me turn to our audience here. And we also do have a comment that we're going to read out in just a minute from the Syracuse Hub. Do you have comments or questions? Yes, please. Please state your name. Thank you, Alan Greenberg. Um, I guess I have a little bit of despair. I wrote a paper on poverty alleviation, ICT for development and poverty alleviation in 2005. Uh, I included the anecdote about someone using a car battery and transporting it to a nearby city to recharge it and then filling cell phones and also included the sage advice, which I didn't originate, of course, I just copied it from other places, of when you build roads, put in communication, and when you put in communication, allow for you know the, the multiple use and cooperation between ministries. It's really disturbing to hear the same thing 13 years later. I actually have a response to that and an idea, but before I do that, let's hear. Well, wait a minute, Alan. You surely don't think it's a dumb idea. It's just that nobody took you up on it, I guess. <laughs> well, the battery is obviously a good idea. It's still, it's still around today. Um, sharing resources and cooperating, uh, everyone thinks it's a good idea, but really difficult, and I don't think people really try. So can I ask the panelists if they have a question for each other? Because then I'm going to read, we're going to read the Syracuse uh, University comment. It's not a question, but uh, just, uh, 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 my name is Kinoshida from uh, Internet Association Japan. Uh, it's not about a question, but uh, just an uh, observation or comment on uh, what I have <laughs> listened to in the last uh, uh, 60 minutes or so. Uh, the things what the you folks have uh, shared and talked about, uh, I would say that there is a commonality with uh, the situation what the people used to do under the disaster relief. When the disaster happened, that uh, the, the people who are affected really need uh, both power and the internet or their communication. So uh, my point is that there might be some uh, best practices could be extended uh, to address the need of the uh, next one billion uh, based upon the practice developed. So, Thank you. It's, yes, you, please, you, Ben. You have plenty of experience with, with disasters, I know. And what we hope is that it doesn't take a disaster in order to get people to cooperate. Thanks, Ben. However, I am going to make a comment about uh, Haiti. Uh, where I was actually very directly involved with colleagues who, um, uh, when it was taking far too long for others to take action, they loaded equipment and luggage and got on planes and landed in Haiti and started setting up um, networks. And they didn't ask permission, they just went and did it. And I think sometimes one of the things that we're seeing is that uh, for um, access and for power, electricity, to come to some of the very remote villages, the work that's going on in community networks, et cetera, is absolutely essential. But those initiatives do not include the third network, the financial network. Um, I wanted to um, 
just kind of do a summing up because then we're actually through uh, with this session. But I am really want to appreciate all of you coming. And I also wanted to note that we had uh, expected Dr. Azizi, who is the head of the regulatory authority from Afghanistan, to be with us. But due to travel challenges, he had to leave a bit too early. But he did extract a commitment from me, Joe. And that is that we will do a workshop related to these issues again next year, and he will be invited again. So I just want to pass that on to everyone about his very strong interest uh, in uh, making sure that um, the government is participating and the government is engaging. Um, three, ne three networks. Would you like to read the Syracuse statement? So this is our reply to Marilyn's point uh, from Mr. Lee McKnight from Syracuse, verbatim. Syracuse University is facilitating establishment of interagency task forces and advisory groups, which include private sector actors. To date, in cooperation with Liberi Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sir Leaf and five ministries, in participation of uh, First Liberian Inter Internet Forum, uh, see litag.org. Similar process thus far with several ministries and five provincial governors in Democratic Republic of Congo, iatag.org, before the first DRC uh, Internet Forum. All participants are welcome to join in, in with Internet Society and myself in facilitating or participating in these modular po policy processes for other countries as well. Liberian President Sirleaf's rural, rural farm home and neighboring village was connected with an IMCOM internet backpack last weekend in rural Liberia as one example of how cooperating with the top also incents all ministries to cooperate to make progress. Hence the need for interagency task forces and advisory groups, as U.S. used decades ago to get the internet going faster in U.S. in the 1990s. So I said I had an idea, it's Marilyn speaking, I had an idea of how to help with this, uh, breaking down the communications between ministries. And actually I know, um, I know that minister very well and have worked with her before through USTTI. Um, I, um, I, one of the problems with the uh, regulatory authorities is when they meet as a group, they meet as a silo. So the, there's a regula, uh, regulators forum at ITU. There's a financial regulators forum. There's an energy ministers forum. They actually are almost never in the same place at the same time. I have an idea. We could think about a day zero event for IGF 2018 and identify four or five countries invite multiple ministries and build a session around the three networks. It would take a lot of work for us to do that ahead of time, but I actually know a few governments like Ghana and maybe Nigeria um, and maybe Namibia where maybe we have some contacts and maybe we might have contacts in Afghanistan. I'm trying to figure that out. Um, but we could think about doing something and try to bring, you know, sort of, edge, ed, and Ben, to your point, uh, if, we're, if we only work in silos, we spend all of our time trying to reach the person who we need to get agreement with, and to Nalmini's point, and if we come in and just repeat our position all the time, we make no progress. So let me, let's please, please, Mikey. Thank you, Marilyn, it's Michael Lucan. Um, I've got a couple of comments. One, uh, electricity, grid interconnection in sub-Saharan Africa, definitely. Namibia, for example, does not produce all its electricity. It imports from South Africa and to Zimbabwe. Um, so that's one. But imagine we pull, we generate and we pull electricity, transmission, etc., cetera, into various areas where it doesn't exist today. And we want to have the internet connectivity to be pulled along, which is Perfectly logical. I think we should also think about water at the same time. Because if you give people the choice of what they may want first, I think I would go for clean water. So I think we need to take that systems point, the systems engineering and systems planning point that Wint made so convincingly, 
all the way to the water energy nexus and essentially piggy bank the communications on top. I'm just, giving Bent a comment and then uh, I'm going to wrap up. Right, just a technical observation. Um, we're starting to understand how photosynthesis works. We may be able to make it even more efficient than it already is. Your idea triggers some thoughts in my own mind about desalinization and the conversion uh, of uh, you know, atmospheric uh, water into, uh, atmospheric properties into water using uh, electrical power. So there's some interesting and intriguing ideas hiding in your suggestion. Thank you all, and I want to, Marilyn Cade speaking, I want to thank all of you for coming, and I, um, I want to, I'm going to end this with the, a comment from um, a president of the United States that I worked very closely with when he was the governor of an adjoining state, uh, President Bill Clinton, and it's something that I have found is extremely helpful uh, comment to keep in mind, and particularly to you, Alan, and that is um, we've talked a lot about the needs and the opportunities. We've identified some of the challenges, but we've also identified some of the maybe iceberg ideas that we should be looking at more deeply. Um, as President Clinton always said, always be sure you stumble in the right direction. <laughs> so I'm going to invite all of you to say thank you to our panel. Thank you to our remote hub because and I've given Wisdom and Garland an assignment to consider, and perhaps they'll reach out to Manu, to consider the idea of how might we develop a, um, a workshop for next year, uh, or if we're worried about not getting approved, focus on a day zero event. Uh, thank you again, everyone, and I'll look forward to seeing you for the next day. My pleasure. Oh, thank you.